Hi, my name is Heather Payton and I'm the oboe professor at the University of Northern Iowa. In this video, I want to talk you through some things you can do to help your oboist build strong fundamental skills. The most common problem with oboe embouchure is biting and shutting down the reed, inhibiting the vibrations. There are four common ways to bite. One is taking your jaw and using the top and bottom pressure to shut down and close the reed. One is smiling, like this. One is bunching up your chin. And another way to bite is having really hard lips. Those are the four most common ways to bite and all of them shut down the reed. We want to support the reed all the way around the surface of the reed and have an embouchure, an American embouchure that supports the design of an American scrape reed and allows the reed to do what it was designed to do. A good American embouchure has the corners of your mouth forward, soft lips, a nice flat chin, not very much different from what you just look like when you're at rest, and it has equal pressure all the way around the mouth, all the way around the reed to support the reed, instead of just using the top and bottom lip to shut it down. I use two analogies to teach a really good American embouchure. The first is whistling. Most people can do a whistle face, even if they can't actually make the sound. They know what it looks like. When I whistle, the corners of my mouth are really far forward, about as far forward as they're gonna get. My lips are nice and squishy because if I tighten them, the sound goes away. And it also makes a nice flat chin. So when I'm whistling, instead of bunching my chin like this, my chin is nice and flat. So whistling takes care of three out of the four things that we want in a good embouchure. I have my corners forward, I have nice squishy lips, and I have a flat chin. To teach the last Thing that we want, the equal pressure, equal hug around the reed, I use a milkshake analogy because I've never met anyone who has not eat, not, not tried a nice thick milkshake. So usually students are, are all about this uh, analogy. So what I'm going to do is pretend that my pinky finger is a straw and I'm going to suck up this milkshake through the straw and it's really thick. When I do that, I feel equal pressure all the way around my finger. And it's important to do this with your finger so you can actually feel what you're touching. If I just bite on my finger, like most students tend to do, that is just shutting down the top and the bottom. And that's a really different feeling than hugging all the way around. And once you get that feeling, all you have to do is recreate that feeling while blowing out. So you can feel equal pressure all the way around the reed. So to make a really good embouchure, we're gonna combine the whistle and the milkshake together. We're gonna start with our corners forward, nice whistle face. We're gonna put a reed in our mouth about halfway down the reed. So I'm gonna make that whistle face, reed in the mouth. I'm gonna roll my corners in, and this is what students have the most hard time doing, is keeping their corners forward while rolling their lips under. So I'm gonna leave my whistle face. I'm gonna keep my corners forward. I'm gonna roll my lips under. And the last thing I'm gonna think about is that equal hug all the way around the reed. So whistle, roll lips under, hug. And there you go. That's how to create a really good embouchure. And students can often, once they get good at just the basic setup, they're fine when they put the reed in their mouth and they get all set up, but when they go to blow, their corners end up going far back. And that's because they don't have enough strength here yet. It takes virtually no muscle to just bite with the top and bottom lift, which is why it's so easy to do. But in order to keep those corners forward, you gotta build some strength. And that's what students are usually lacking. So what you can have them do to start off is use a mirror when they practice and have them just blow really, really slow air. And they're gonna gradually increase that air speed. It's gonna take more and more resistance while really focusing on keeping those corners forward. If I do that, Eventually, the sound is gonna come in. And they should concentrate on not moving their corners back, not getting into that smile position. So that's what I would recommend when you're just starting a student and they're just working on that corner straight. In order to actually build strength, all you need is your reed. You don't even need an oboe to build strength and get these corner muscles working. We are going to just put the reed in our mouth and we're gonna just hold it there 
while really working these muscles, really pushing the muscles as far forward as you possibly can, really feeling that they're working. And if you have a student do this, they can just leave their read in their mouth while they're doing homework or while they're watching TV. It's, it's something you can do away from the oboe and it builds strength rather quickly and they can really feel those muscles working. It's like weightlifting, you're gonna wanna stop and, and just stretch your mouth after you do it for a little while. So that's a really fast way to build strength away from the oboe. Once you get good at that, once you get good at building strength away from the oboe, then you wanna actually be playing and using your reed as well to build that strength. So one of the things that we're gonna do with students is mark in their music how far they can go without losing their face. It's really important with students that you're showing them or having a way that they can keep track of their progress and to see that they're really making progress as they're building their skills. And so what I do is I take a piece of music and as soon as, an as, soon as the student loses their embouchure, I have them stop. Reset their embouchure, but also mark in their music how far they could go before they lost their face. And that way, their only goal is the next time I practice, I'm gonna get at least one note further before I have to stop and make a marking. And that's a really nice visual way to help students keep track and to give them a goal in when they're building their skills for their embouchure. And you can do that with any type of music. You can do it with long tones or any other warm ups. You can do it with scales or you can do it with any music they're playing. Just get in the habit of having them stop and mark their music so that they can continue that embouchure strength. Once a student has built up their embouchure muscles so they have con some control over those corner muscles, then you can check in with their embouchure and make sure everything sounds good by doing a couple of things. The first is crowing on the reed. So this also helps for pitch. Your reed should crow a two octave C. Here's a C. And you can hear I can get two octaves, a higher octave and a lower octave there. The higher one comes out first. And if I blow harder, the lower one should come out. That shows that you're not biting. It also shows that the reed is in your mouth in the right place, because if I'm farther out, or farther in, the pitch will change drastically. So that shows a student about how far in or out to just have the reed when the reed is just crowing a C, which it should be. So I would always start with that. Take the reed out, and the first thing you're gonna do is crow it, make sure your embouchure is set, make sure you can get that two octave C. The next thing I have students do is a warm up, just to check in with their embouchure and make sure everything is still looking good once they've built that strength up is something I call the hug test. And this checks that you're using enough pressure all the way around the reed that you're really holding the reed firmly in place. When we're, we're trying not to bite, but we're also trying not to be really flabby. We have to be able to hold the reed in place so that when you articulate, the reed isn't bouncing all over the place. So a good test for that is to have a student take the reed and blow through it with no hands using their embouchure and have them tongue hard. And when they're tonguing, if the reed is flopping all over the place, that means they're not supporting the reed around the reed enough to have good control of the reed. So that looks like this. The basic shape of the embouchure is okay, but you can see I don't have enough firm pressure. I'm not hugging enough around the reed to keep it from bouncing all over the place. So once your student has their embouchure, they should work up to being able to hold that in place. without the reed bouncing all over the place. And that is just a good check-in. So check in and crow the reed, make sure it's out of C before they start. Check in with a hug test to just make sure their embouchure is still strong. And then the other thing we can talk about for embouchure is orienting the reed on, on your lip. So you want to make sure that when you're breathing that the reed stays on your lip. Most people pick the bottom lip, but it doesn't matter. You could also pick the top lip. And we want to leave it there so I can talk to you and my reed can just rest on my lip. And that means when I go to play, I can set my embouchure really quickly. So when I breathe, I can come right back to it. And I'm likely to be more, much more consistent with starting my sound, with creating good sound, and being able to come in when I need to after a breath if I keep my reed oriented on the lip. It also means that I'm less likely to crack my reed on my teeth than if I'm going like this. It's an easy thing to do to crack a reed on a tooth. So this helps prevent that. Just make sure you teach a student when they're playing that the reed should just stay on either their top or bottom lip at all times.
The oboe can be an awkward, uncomfortable instrument to play, and so we wanna make the hand position and the setup of the instrument as comfortable as possible to make sure that we get rid of tension and that we make it more comfortable for students so that they'd be more likely to wanna to practice and improve. The first thing I always do with students is adjust the height of their thumb rest. So on my oboe, I have a thumb rest that will move side to side and up and down, so it's highly adjustable, but that's not the case for most oboes. And so you have to be able to figure out how high or low the thumb rest needs to be for a student and also then how to adjust it to make it comfortable. So here's what we're gonna do. What you want your students to do is hold their oboes with their left hand in front of them, kind of on the joint between the top joint and the bottom joint and let the rest of their, their right hand, let it just hang free, shake it out, let it hang. And you want them to be relaxed. So when they pick up their hand, they shouldn't try to make an oboe hand or anything like that. And the problem with what we do is anytime we pick something up, we pick it up like we're picking up a glass and we have a lot of tension because we're squeezing when we do that. We don't want to do that with the oboe. So we want to get our hands as relaxed as possible. So just let the hand be floppy and loose, put it under the thumb rest and see where the pinky lands. So I'm dragging my fingers back once I get that spot and my pinky lands right on this key, the C sharp key, the key that's right in the middle of the pinky keys on the right hand. And that's really important. That's where you want your, your pinky to rest so that you can get to any of these keys as needed. So what you need to do is adjust the height of the thumb rest to a position that allows that to happen. Now, buying a thumb rest can be really expensive. So if you buy an adjustable thumb rest, you have to have one that fits your type of instrument and it can be very, very expensive. But there are some really cheap options out there that I wanna show you. First off, you could buy a wine cork or just take a wine cork from somewhere and you're gonna carve a little notch in the cork so that it can just fit right over the thumb rest. And this is really nice because it can come on and off so it can just live in the case when it's not in use and you just take the oboe out and you cut it off. It's comfortable on the thumb and you can cut it to whatever exact height you need to have your thumb be rest or to have your pinky be resting on that C sharp key. Okay, so you can adjust the height of this thumb rest in order to make that happen. So the wine cork is the super cheap option for this, you just have to carve out a little notch. This is also really good if you're sharing instruments, like if you have students that are playing English horn or something like that. English horn is horrible because it's so much bigger, right? So we really have to adjust the height of the thumb rest, but everybody needs their own height. So having something like this that you can quickly take on and off that's personal for you is, is a good thing to have. So this is a really cheap option, DIY. The next thing I really like is any kind of tubing that you put around windows for either, you know, boats or cars or anything like that. It comes in a big roll and you can get lots of different types of foam and whatever else. And so I just cut a little piece off of the roll. It's sticky on one side and you just stick it to your thumb rest. And if you need more than, that, than one of these, you can double them up like this. You can just um, combine them on top of each other and it sticks right to the cork that's already there on your thumb rest. I do that on my oboe anyway because it's nice and squishy and makes it more comfortable. So even though I have an adjustable thumb rest, I adjust it for the height that works with that little piece of weather stripping. Okay, and that way I can be comfortable and have my hand rest where it should be. The other option if you want to buy a thumb rest, there's a really great thumb rest. It's called All Thumbs Rest and it's this big piece of thumb rest material and it has it's squishy kind of a padded and it's got velcro on one side and you use the velcro to attach it to the thumb rest so there's a piece of velcro that goes under the thumb rest and then there's this it sticks to it so you can again take it on and off to fit it in the case as needed but what's nice about this is that i can put it on in any angle I want. So I can have it cover a lot of my thumb or a little of my thumb, I can angle it. So it's a really flexible option and that's only around $20 or so. So if you're looking for an option that you can buy, that's another good one, all thumbs rest. So those are my suggestions for what to use to find the correct height of the thumb rest. And that is incredibly important because it's gonna set up how comfortable your whole right hand is. Now the next thing that you wanna do in order to be really comfortable with the oboe is adjust the space between the F sharp key and the E key, these two. Now I have a fancy key on my oboe because I have really little hands that goes above the key so that I can just be completely normal when I play like this. But for students, you can recreate something like this for them so that they can also avoid this really big spread that creates just a ton of tension. As soon as you do this with your hands, you can feel all that tension in your hand. 
So what I do for that is I go back to the hardware store, which we shop at a lot as oboe players, and I buy little cork furniture bumpers. I like the cork ones because they're easy to cut and you can feel the cork when you're pressing on them, so you always hit the key in the right place. And you just take one of these, peel it off, and you stick it on the edge of your key like that. So if I didn't have this lip here, I would have just covered the end of the key. And what that's gonna allow you to do is now play farther down on that key. It's gonna decrease the spread. So that's another really easy way to make the oboe more comfortable. And that's the biggest problem, the thumb rest position and how big that spread is in your hand on the F sharp key and on the E key. You just have to make sure that you're not hitting this little vent key that's between them, either with your finger or with the cork. Just keep it far enough up that you're not gonna accidentally close that vent key when you're doing this. But other than that, that's a really great way to make the oboe more comfortable, adding that piece of cork. Once you get that all settled, then we can talk about balancing the oboe. So, like I said, when we're picking up an oboe, or picking up anything, most often we pick it up like we pick up a glass where we're squeezing when we do that. And the problem is that that's gonna create hand tension. And because the oboe is already being held up by the right hand and right arm and, and the side of your body, we wanna try to eliminate as much tension as possible. So we wanna try balancing our oboe. And to balance the oboe, I need to rest it on my thumb, so that's why I have the thumb rest in the right place. And I also need to have a point that allows the oboe not to fall forward. And in this case, we're gonna use our index finger on our left hand. And this is a really great one to use as a point of leverage because it hardly ever lifts all the way up. It's always attached to the key in some way when I'm playing the notes, almost always. So it's a really good thing to have for leverage. So I'm balancing here and I'm just putting my other hand here to keep the oboe from falling forward. And then I can have all of the rest of my fingers completely relaxed completely relaxed. So if I'm balancing, I have this little leverage activity here. It's just creating a nice, nice, nice fulcrum here. And I can relax the rest of my hand. So you want to get students really good at that, relaxing all of their fingers while just having the thumb rest. Rest on the thumb and be supported by that first finger. And other than that, it just only takes the weight of gravity to really hold that first finger in place. Everything is nice and relaxed. Now, the next thing is curving the fingers, right? Making sure you have a finger curve. It's really common, especially on the fourth fingers, the ring fingers on the oboe, to have really flat fingers like this, or collapsing like this, or even being double jointed like this. Really common, especially on the fourth fingers. Those are the ones that usually leak when students are playing. So always double check that those are covering fourth fingers on both hands. But in general, we wanna have nice curved fingers that all move from this back knuckle. Okay, and not collapsing and, and doing all sorts of other things. That's a sign of tension. It also makes your technique just slower and more um, labored. So we wanna have nice curved fingers. One of the ways that we're gonna think about curving our fingers, especially on our right hand, is how far in we need to be on our thumb rest. So if I need my fingers to be nice and just normally curved, like a little C shape, here they are curved, and I put them on the key so that they cover the holes, then that's gonna show me exactly how far out I need to be on the thumb rest. Now, some people with really big hands might need to be way farther in, but I have small hands, so I'm gonna be much farther out on my thumb rest. And that just is gonna be a personal thing. Wherever you need to be in order to have that nice curve is where you need to sit on your, that thumb rest. So once you get all that set up, then you can practice curving your fingers nicely, especially those four fingers and not having the pinkies fly all over the place. What I do for students is I take a piece of scotch tape, and they do this when they practice at home too, and I just find that nice beautiful finger curve that they need, and then I put a, we put a little piece of scotch tape just around this middle knuckle, and just not tight or anything, but it just gives them some feedback because students often just can't feel what they're doing. They can't, unless they're looking in a mirror, which they can't often do that and play at the same time, they're not able to feel when they're collapsing their fingers. They need that sensation of having something that will give them feedback, and the tape will give you feedback because as soon as you start collapsing your fingers, you feel the tape press up against your knuckle. And then it tells you, oh, wait, I have to readjust. So using just a, a piece of scotch tape and loosely winding around is a really good tool to help somebody have nice curved fingers. The other thing that students do is lift their fingers up like crazy when they're playing, which means they, they make a lot of noise because they're slapping the keys and they also um, miss notes because they can't put their fingers down fast enough and they're not settled on the hole. So you want to teach finger, or you want to teach your students to just lift their fingers just as much as they need to. So some of the exercises I do is I'll have students play their scales, but they can't lift their fingers off the key. So it's incredibly 
hard to do to try to not lift your fingers off so that they're always touching the key, okay, to really get used to that. Or I'll have them play and I'll put my hand in front of them so they feel when they're lifting off too high, especially in their pinky fingers. Those are the ones that tend to be kind of all over the place when students play. Or they can practice in front of a music stand so they have that in front of them and they can feel when they when they hit the stand if they're close enough to the stand they can feel when they're lifting their fingers too high so i would look for all of those things have nice curved fingers have nice relaxed fingers so you're always just barely pressing the keys in like a really kind of nice gentle way and their fingers are always kind of in motion there's no like lift up to slap down which is what students do they like rev up and then they slap their keys so they can listen to make sure that they're not hearing that loud slapping sound and they can also feel that they're gently pressing the key. It should only take the weight of gravity to close the keys. There should never be tension. So one of the, my favorite exercises to do with students is to have them play while their eyes are closed and having pulling off their fingers. So the way that works is I like to use low D and I like to play as loud as possible because usually the louder a student is playing, the more they're squeezing, okay? So have them play a low D have them close their eyes and as they're playing, you just pick a finger and you flick it off and you can feel right away how tense they are. And usually students have no idea. They think that they're fine. And then you try this exercise, especially on their right hand and they, they barely move. You try to pry their fingers off and they go nowhere. And so this is a really good exercise to show students really how tense they are. And then to show them how light they can be. Work on that ability to just have really light fingers that just bounce right back when you're, when you're playing. It's in the area of breathing that the oboe really differs from other wind instruments. And the most important thing to know is that we always have too much air as oboe players. And you in fact need practically no air at all, even to make a sound. And that's one of the first things I show students when we start talking about breathing, because they never believe that you don't actually have to inhale in order to play the oboe. So here, I'm gonna exhale all my air and play a note. And there you go. And I can hold that note for quite a long time because really we always have too much air and it's all about how learning to take air in and exhale air in the most relaxed way possible to make sure that we're always regulating our air and that we're not feeling like we're constantly holding our breath and have too much carbon dioxide. So we want to make the oboe comfortable and usually oboe players are not very comfortable on breathing and it really interferes with endurance unless they learn how to breathe in the way that works best for oboe. So let's start with the inhale. When you inhale on the oboe, Unlike other instruments, other instruments do breath building exercises. They're trying to take in as much air as possible. We want to basically just do belly breathing, diaphragmatic breathing. So we are going to basically have all of this chest and shoulder area completely relaxed. And I'm going to have one hand on my stomach and one hand on my chest. And I'm just going to inhale. And the only thing that moves is my stomach. All of this just may, remains nice and relaxed. I'm not, I'm not taking enough air where I need to really inflate the rest of my chest and my shoulders. I don't need to create that kind of space. I'm trying to take in just very little amount of air because we just, no matter how little you take in, you'll always have too much when you play the oboe. So that's the first step. Show a student that they truly do not need any air to play the oboe and then teach them how to properly inhale so that they're really not expanding in the upper part of their body. Stay nice and relaxed. Now, when we exhale, we wanna start the sound from our abdomen muscles. They are what push our air back out. So we've taken it in, it's down here. What we're gonna do then is push it back out from these muscles. And I think a good analogy for this is just to sniff. We can all sniff if you sniff your stomach muscles push out and we want to recreate that on the oboe when we exhale so I'm going to do the same type of thing except instead of sniffing in this time I'm going to try to push air out using those same muscles and I'll just do it out my nose like I was sniffing so this is sniffing in and then this is blowing out And I'm really starting from that same place with those same muscles, okay? Those are the muscles that you felt if you that you feel working when you exhale all of your air and then you try to play a note. Those are those muscles that we're using right now. And they run all the way around your stomach, your abdominal muscles. 
So once you can do that, once you can just start the motion <laughs> by getting your stomach muscles to push the air out, then I'm just gonna open my mouth. And when I do that, if I'm nice and relaxed and my chest is relaxed and my throat is relaxed, I'm not gonna get <sighs> that kind of a sound. That means everything up here is tense. I'm trying to be as relaxed as possible when I breathe. So I inhale and then I exhale. And I'm not trying to say any particular syllable, but by the virtue of the fact that my mouth is open and I'm pushing out from here, I'm gonna get a ha, a low ha kind of a sound. And that's how we want to create sound on the oboe. So we've talked about inhaling and we've talked about exhaling using our stomach muscles to push that air out. Once you get good at that and you've put it on the reed alone and then you've put it on the oboe so that you can start a sound here. You can have students do that, put one hand on their stomach and then just play an easy note like a B or an A that only requires the left hand. And then they can feel that they're originating the sound from that place. And once you can do the inhale and the exhale, there's one more type of breath. And this is the big key that a lot of oboe players just aren't aware of and therefore they get themselves into trouble. So here's what typically happens when oboe players breathe. Every time they go to breathe, they already have so much carbon dioxide built up from holding their breath because we have way too much air all the time that they need to get rid of that air before they inhale. So we get a lot of this. So what's going on is every time they take a breath, they exhale all their air and then they inhale. And that's really loud. If you do it often enough, it makes you lightheaded. It's like hyperventilating in your body. It's not very comfortable to do that. And what happens over time is that your body gets tired from all the carbon dioxide and it keeps telling you to inhale, inhale, inhale because you feel like you need air. But in fact, the opposite is true. You don't actually need to inhale any more air. You have plenty of air, but it's all carbon dioxide. We need to get rid of air. So oboists need to learn how to breathe out. And one of the things I like to talk about is using little puff breaths, like so you're exhaling air, but it's only a tiny little bit at a time. And this go, this is like swimming. If you're swimming underwater, you're holding your breath. And then if you hold your breath the whole time, when you come up to take a clean breath, you have to get rid of all that carbon dioxide before you can take an inhale. And that's a lot of work to do on that little time that you have when, if you're swimming laps or something that you can put your head out of the water. So instead, swimmers will blow bubbles underwater to get rid of the carbon dioxide little by little so that by the time they actually get to take a breath, they don't have to get rid of more carbon dioxide. They have clean lungs. They can just take a nice inhale and it feels much more comfortable. And we can do the same thing on the oboe. So instead of just inhaling and totally exhaling, which we can do, what we can also do is take little puff breaths. can do that just like blowing bubbles underwater I can just let go of a little bit of air here and there as I play and that way when I finally do get to inhale I feel relaxed I have just nice clean air that I can take in and I never feel like I have to force my air out in order to take a clean breath in so once students learn how to inhale and exhale they should learn how to puff these little puff breaths and then i like to do this exercise called the puff exercise because it helps them learn that they need to take either one of the, all, any of the three breaths. They need to take any of the three breaths in the same amount of time with the same pitch on anything they play after. So usually what happens with students is if they play and they exhale and then play another note, if they don't have enough support and enough air support here to get that note to come out, it's really flat. So what they need to start learning how to do is regulating their support with the amount of air that needs to be used in order to have that have the same pitch. So in this exercise, we're checking, can you take all the breaths in the same amount of time? Because it's fast to inhale, it's fast to puff, but to totally exhale, if you don't work at it and learn how to regulate that, it can take a really long time. So all breaths in the same amount of time and the same pitch after each note. So when we do this exercise, you're gonna put a metronome on, and every click of the metronome is going to be either a rest where you're gonna breathe or a note, and you're gonna repeat it. 
And the nice thing about this exercise is that it's really comfortable. You could do this all day long because you're regulating your breathing. You're getting rid of the carbon dioxide little by little so that you can always take in clean air. So this is what this exercise sounds like. And you can hear the different types of air I'm taking in versus pushing out, the different types of breath. And you can hear the sound difference between the inhale, the puff, and the total exhale. And you can learn how to do any of these breaths silently, of course. This is a way more comfortable exercise than doing this. which is how most oboe players breathe when they're not taught any better. So teach your students the puff exercise to really help them regulate so that they're feeling really comfortable at all times. Then what we're gonna do is create a breathing map for every piece that we play. When oboists create a breathing map, they find places where they're gonna breathe. And unlike other instruments where they just inhale every time they get to breathe, we are gonna plan to breathe out. Lot, a lot more often than we're breathing in. So if we're breathing in at the beginning, maybe our next breath will be a puff breath and then maybe another puff breath and then finally another inhale. We use more inhales and puff breaths than we do total exhales. Those are usually saved for when you have longer rests and you can really let go all of your air. If you're playing something that's got a um, hard for endurance, like a lot of Baroque music for oboe um, is just, you play for a long time without a lot of time to breathe, a lot of time then you need to really exhale all your air to really reset and take in fresh air. But overall, we use inhales and puff breaths the most often. So every time you breathe, you decide where you're gonna breathe and you take that same breath every time and then you decide the type of breath you're gonna take. So if the first breath an inhale every time I practice I'm gonna take that inhale and if the next breath is a puff every time I practice I'm gonna breathe in that spot and I'm gonna take a puff and that shows us how to create a comfortable breathing map and how to rely on that breathing map when we're actually in performance to try out a breathing map you always start from the beginning so if I go and I put in all my breaths and in the beginning you're just gonna guess where are these breaths gonna go is it gonna be comfortable or not over time when you get better at regulating your breaths then it's going to be faster. Students will be much faster at creating their breathing maps and having breathing maps that work right away. But usually we gotta try them out. So we'll put in all the breaths and then we'll start at the beginning and play all the way through and then we'll go back and make any adjustments. But you always wanna try a breathing map from the beginning to the end so that you can really check that the breaths that you chose in the beginning and the middle and the end are all gonna work when you start at the beginning and play through the whole piece. So I can't stress enough the importance of learning how to properly breathe on the oboe, to do a proper inhale so you're not taking in a ton of air, to exhale so you're starting your sound from the right place and so that you can be as relaxed as possible. And also that puff breath so you can really learn how to regulate your breathing and make it really comfortable. And then the breathing map is key. You always wanna write in that breathing map and treat each wrong breath like a wrong note so that you're constantly practicing having that, that clean, comfortable air. Having good support is essential as an oboe player for good tone, for good pitch, and especially for when trying to play soft and have really good dynamic control. We want to develop support along with the airstream. So we've already found the support muscles that we need. We did that when we exhaled all of the air and really found where those muscles were when we tried to play a note on a total exhale. So if I exhale all my air, and I play a note, I immediately feel the muscles in my abdominal area that are pushing in order to create that sound. Now, how do we strengthen these muscles? Well, I do something called the clock exercise. I get a timer, something with a second hand that you can see, and I set the timer and I have a student exhale all of their air, really get rid of it. Most students will try to cheat and not really get rid of all of it, but really get rid of all of the air and hold a note as long as they can. And the goal is to get one second longer each time they do this exercise. So if they start and they can only get one second, well, that's great. Next time, it's gonna be two seconds. And eventually they're gonna get all the way up to 20, 25, 30 seconds where they can hold a note without having inhaled at all, okay? So that is one of the, the great exercises that we have to really build our support muscles, but it's not comfortable. It's like going to the gym, when you really, really push as hard as you can to keep that sound going, you start shaking, you turn red, and when you stop, when you finally get to inhale, your body just automatically takes in a whole lot of air. 
So while this is not a comfortable exercise, it's a great exercise. And so what I usually do for students is make it a competition or give out prizes or, you know, do something fun to make sure that they're, they're enjoying competing to get how many seconds farther they can get next week. It's really important with this exercise that you coach students. So as they're going, you're counting for them on the clock and you're saying, keep going, keep going. You can do it. You can do it and be their cheerleader. Because like I said, it's not comfortable, but it's completely necessary. So it's a really fast way to build these support muscles. Once you have those muscles going, one of the other things oboe players need to learn how to do is blow all the way through the instrument. Because the reed is what makes the noise, students will often only blow enough air so that the reed starts to vibrate. And they don't think about blowing all the way through the instrument and getting their air really going all the way through. So the exercise that I use to help students really think about blowing all the way through the oboe is the Doc Severinsen exercise, named for famous trumpeter Doc Severinsen because he used to warm up without a mouthpiece so that he could remember what it felt like to blow through the instrument when the, the resistance of the mouthpiece was gone. And we need to do the same thing. Take away the reed and just blow through the oboe to remind ourselves what that feels like, to really use that kind of air. So I'm gonna finger my lowest note. In this case, that's B flat. And that's closing all the holes. So every, it's gonna go straight through the bell when I do this. What I'm gonna do is breathe through the reed well at the top of the oboe, and I'm gonna push my air through, and at the end, I'm gonna crescendo. So I don't wanna taper, I don't wanna do this. Where the sound tapers. Instead, I wanna do the opposite with a big old crescendo right to the very end. And I'm looking for that really dense sound at the end of that crescendo. If they can take that and get that nice dense sound and then blow through the oboe like that, they're really gonna fill up and get a great sound that moves their air all the way through the instrument. So that's vitally important. So build good support with the clock exercise, then teach the doc severance and exercise to get them to blow all the way through the oboe. The other thing that students often neglect to do is blow with enough air speed. So we want fast, small air for the oboe. It has to fit through that little tiny opening in the reed, right? So we want a really small airstream, but we want it to be fast as it moves. So what we're gonna work on is the ability to change that air speed. So the first thing I do is have students blow on their hands so they can just feel how fast their air is moving. Speeding it up, slowing it down, and they can hear it and they can feel the difference. Then what I have students do is take a balloon and count to eight and they have to blow the balloon up steadily over eight counts so that they're using the same amount of air for all eight counts. Then we do the same exercise, but they only get four counts to blow up the balloon the same way. And they'll notice when they do that exercise that their air has to move so much faster when they do the four counts versus the eight counts. So it gets them really to think about airspeed and how to make a change in their airspeed. Then we put that fast four count air on the oboe to really just blow and fill up the sound, moving all the way through the instrument so that they always have forward motion in their air when they're blowing. That helps them connect notes and create legato because otherwise the oboe can be very um, vertical in terms of students just playing one note and kind of stopping between each note. In order to really play with legato and to create a nice big sound, we want them to blow all the way through the instrument at all times and have their fingers just skim the top of that air. When talking about intonation and pitch on the oboe, it's important to realize that unlike other instruments, we can't actually change anything physically on the instrument to change the pitch. So I can't separate the joints to make things sharper or flatter, and I cannot pull the reed in and out of the reed well here. It has to be firmly in contact with the bottom of the reed well at all times. And you would think like other instruments, they take their mouthpieces and they move them in or out in order to change the pitch. But for us, if we do that, we're creating a little tiny pocket of air between the bottom of the tube and where the oboe starts. And all that does, it doesn't actually affect whether the instrument is overall sharp, sharp or flat. What it does though, it, is it makes the scale out of tune. So each note is slightly out of tune with the notes around it. And so it's going to do the opposite of what you want. It's going to make it harder to play in tune if you start moving the reed around. So always make sure the reed is firmly in place at the very, very bottom, as far in as it will go. And that is the first thing that you should know about oboe intonation. So then the question is, well, how do we tune as oboe players? And I'm gonna talk about two different things that we can do. 
The first is using a tuning slide effect. So that means literally just making the instrument longer or shorter by putting more or less reed in our mouth. And I'm gonna show you this on octave notes. Octave notes for us are very flexible notes, so they're really good for, for working on pitch. So when I have students work on pitch, I often do it with octave notes because they can really get flexible and work on moving in and out and finding that, that sweet spot where it's actually in tune. So here's an octave A. To use the tuning slide, all I'm gonna do is move in and out of my mouth. And I'm gonna kind of roll on my lips and my lip will move as well. Sounds like this. And you want students to be nice and flexible. So you want them to be, have that ability to really change pitch, especially going down. We're really good at pitch bending down, but it, we don't bend up quite as easily on oboe. So concentrate on that, having the most flexibility possible. When I start working on pitch, I'm always working on embouchure flexibility. If they can't change the pitch, When they move in and out, it means they are biting. They're using the top and bottom pressure to shut down the reed instead of letting the reed vibrate. So you really want them in the beginning to be as flexible and move around as much as possible. To get that pitch going. And they should leave the rest of their embouchure alone. So once you have good embouchure, all you need to do is move in and out of the mouth in order to make that work. Of course, your reed has to crow a C. So that's the other thing you should always check before working on the pitch, right? Just as part of the daily warm-ups, make sure that you can get that two octave C. That shows you about how far to put the reed in, in just in general. And then when you're moving around, you're moving in little increments. So what I have students do when they practice this is put a drone on and be as flexible, and we'll make it on A. Here we go for this note. I'm trying to get them as sharp and flat as possible and then to hone in on it. And finding that ability, oops, that ability to match the pitch. Okay, you always want to use a drone when working on tuning. It doesn't do us any good to use the needle on a tuner because that that makes us tune with our eyes and we always need to be listening because there's no other way to tune. We have to use our ears. We have to become very, very good at listening to our pitch and matching the pitch of others around us. So that's the first method, the tuning slide. And you wanna be as flexible as possible, have students move all over the place and then have them focus and hone in on that pitch. And then once they get good at that, then you can practice having them start and be right there again with the drone. and have that ability to just hit the pitch exactly where they want it. Now, of course, this will be way easier if you're using a consistent reed source. So if you're always getting reeds from the same person and they're made the same way and they crow a two octave C and they're consistent, then you're much likely, more likely to know exactly where you need to be on the reed for any of the notes on the oboe. You can just automatically go and move in those little micro motions to find the exact right pitch. If you have a reed that's not consistent or is made by a bunch of different people and is always the pitch is slightly different and notes are slightly in different places, your student's gonna have a much harder time being able able to know exactly where to play the note. They're going to have to spend a lot more time really listening and making a lot of adjustments in and out to find that pitch. So again, have a quality read source, make sure it crows a two octave C and you'll already be eliminating much of the pitch problems. Then check the embouchure, make sure the embouchure is not biting so that they actually have the flexibility they need to actually change the pitch by using the tuning slide. So that's the first me method of pitch changing using the tuning slide. We can also do a little bit more fine tuning by pressing into just one of our lips, not both, not biting, but taking the oboe and either moving it to the top lip or the bottom lip while leaving the other lip alone. What that does is give us just a little bit of more pitch change sharper. And this is good for octave notes when you're trying not to bite on them and have the same good sound that you have on the rest of the notes without biting. And octave notes tend to be flat on the oboe, so we sometimes need a little bit more help and we can get that by pressing into our lip. And for low notes, low notes are also very flat on the oboe. And if you bite on them, they just gurgle or they stop working and the notes break. And so one of the things you can do instead of biting with both lips is just to press the oboe into one lip or the other.
That looks like this. So I'm literally just using some weight, the weight of gravity, pulling my, my oboe towards my lip while not changing my armature. And we have a lot of flexibility in that area too. So the number one way to tune is using that tuning slide, developing your ear. The second way is pressing into one of your lips. And some people like the top lip better, some people like the bottom lip better. Experiment and find out which one works the best for your students. Now I've already mentioned playing with a tuner drone instead of a needle. That I can't emphasize enough. My favorite app is Tonal Energy. Um, it has a nice smiley face so students are, get happy and excited when they're in tune because it gives you that nice green smiley face. And it has a lot of features like building chords built into it with a drone um, that you can use to help students work on tuning and work on their pitch. I play a lot of pitch games with students. I'll change the pitch and they'll have to find it and match me. Um, we'll do duets and change the pitch around. There's lots of things you can do to play with pitch to really work on the, a student's ability to hear what you want them to listen to and their ability to just hear sharp and flat in general will go up as you work on with them, work on pitch with them. For information on reads, tone, choosing instruments, and recommended repertoire for teaching, see my clinic handout. If you have questions, want to set up an oboe lesson or class for your students, or would like to buy reads, contact me at heather.payton at uni.edu.